So uh, welcome, thank you for coming. Uh, this is uh, a talk on reversing and exploiting embedded devices, you know, just in case that wasn't obvious. <laughs> so let's just get going, let's just get started with this. But actually before I get started, I have one question. Who here has actually done exploitation on embedded devices, either MIPS or ARM? Awesome. Did you take that POC all the way to code exec? Awesome. <laughs> cool. So that's what we'll be talking about here too as well. Like, uh, so anyways, let's get started. So this is the outline for my talk. It's a little hour, it's about an hour long or so, but I'm going to go through a little bit quickly. Um, I've, I've done this talk before, but kind of like scaled it back on the technicalities, but since this is DEF CON, we're going to go full technical for a little bit. So this is the outline. I'm not going to go through it, but let's just say we're going to get a little technical and after this, we're going to go on an adventure to actually take the stuff that's in this talk and find our own O days and products in today. And that's what we're doing tomorrow. But who am I, right? I'm like who's this kid up there wearing all black? So my name's Elvis. N real name, I love how everyone's cell phones started going out taking pictures <laughs> when, I, when I said that. I'm a senior security researcher at a local pen testing firm in Austin, Texas called Praetorian. I got into IoT research completely by accident, right? I started off in desktop space and this whole IoT embedded device, device stuff got just completely by accident. The long, the long story that short was that I had a coworker who found a vuln, a really nasty vuln, took him three seconds to find it with a really dumb fuzzer and I said if you can do it, why can't I? And now I'm in this trap. So um, I'm also known as Black Owl on Twitter. That's cool. So let's get started. So like I said, I found some bugs because I got competitive with a, co a former coworker of mine who found bugs really, really easily, high impact bugs that was affecting the entire SDK of the manufacturer. So I just did the same thing. I was fuzzing. HP daemon, everything I think of, the method, the URI path, HP 1.0, 1.1, 0 0.9, host with long everything, maybe tons of new lines, no new lines, everything I could think of, the UPnP interface with SOAP, all the methods I can think of, anything that takes a string, let's put command injection, let's put 3000 A's, nothing was happening. My device was all happy dory going, no problem man, we got this. So then I started taking it further. I was like, well, what about like directory traversal? Maybe pull some files. We do double percent encoding, mixed characters. So we can do like percent 25, uh, 41 for like capital A, or let's just do all these crazy things or command it. Just fuzz everything, but nothing was working. So what did work was I actually had to sit down. I took the firmware completely apart with Binwalk, which is fantastic. And I found hidden APIs that you would never find on the front end by fuzzing by disassembling this that was inside the binary itself. You would not find it in the file system, it was inside the binary itself. And this particular one was it would take the, the value from submit URL and pass it straight to system. Pretty dope. <laughs> so digging into firmware. So like I said, fuzzing stuff on the outside may just only get you on the surface. Some of the nasty stuff that you want to get into is going to be deep. You're going to have to dig for it. So extracting firmware binaries. Who here has heard of Binwalk? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Binwalk is an amazing tool. It's long, like a like very, very high level what Binwalk is. It's a magic byte parser and extractor. That's all it does. If you look at the configuration files for Binwalk, it is just using libmagic. Offset this. This is the byte like cafe bay for like Java, right? And it just goes through the entire structure. It's supposed to be matching the entire structure up before doing any kind of extraction. If there's any kind of false positives inside of that, and when you see the word invalid for this kind of stuff, it's supposed to be reducing false positives. So that's Binwalk in a nutshell. Very, very simple, straightforward, but it's super powerful. But it can also be annoying if you're dealing with dumps that are not particularly organized properly, and Binwalk just goes crazy and just says everything's an LZMA block. So great. So we can extract firmware that we can download off the internet that's not encoded or anything like that. Fun fact, a lot of encoding stuff is usually like single byte or multi byte XOR, so don't worry there. Um, so when I got into embedded devices, well, that's a lot of people. What's up, guys? Um, the one thing I didn't know was the assembly for it. I started off in x86, 64 land. I didn't know MIPS assembly. Like, what the hell's a branch? What the, what the hell's all this stuff? But what I did know was C. And I was like, well, let me just do exactly what I did in x86. I'll just create C, compile it, maybe with some different flags, see what else comes out, and then just step through it. So this is exactly what I did. So right here, I have a local uh, integer called ret red val. And it is initialized to zero. And in MIPS we have a dedicated register called zero. It's just always null. So right here I know that we have a something called store word zero to an offset 24 of S8. 24 S8, S8 is also known as a frame pointer, also known as EBP if you want to say. So we are now, we, we know we're in the local uh, 
local variable for this function. Great. So I know S8 and I know the, the offset for that, uh, for that value. So we go further. What about calling functions? How do arguments get passed in this, uh, in this, uh, in this architecture? So the very first one I pass hex 44, which in base 10 would be 68. And then second uh, argument, which is A1, which is hex 65 or 101 in decimal, which is A1. Great. So now we know when we're calling a function, those A registers, A0, A1, A2, A3, are going to be pointers to the arguments that we're going to pass to this function. Great. This is super simple. So now we know like where, you know, initializing happens. I know where arguments get passed. What about return values, right? So I have this function called test and I do a ret 66 or whatever it is, right? Well, remember that same offset 24 SA that we saw for the beginning? That's ret val. So now we know V0, whenever a function returns, it's going to contain the value of the return from the previous function. Cool. And then we do it again, printf. Second argument is going to be an A1 because the first argument is the format string, right? And then we just keep going and then this is the final one where we finally return from main. And I put a D word in there, 43, 40, all capital C's, right? So we have an LUI of two bytes and an ORI of two bytes. And I was like, all right, that's kind of cool, but what is actually ORI doing? Because I don't feel like reading the assembly manual right now and I just kind of want to see what's going on. So it's, it's everything we've always done when we're trying to learn new assembly stuff. We just set the breakpoint. We make sure step mode is on. We step one to make sure that instruction was executed. We double check to make sure the execution happened. We check the value. So now we know when LUI two bytes happen, the greatest significant two bytes of that register will be that value. And then the lowest significant bytes, this is an ORI. So it's an OR integer, but the lowest significant, since it was null, 4343 gets populated and the whole D word gets populated into that register. Why did it have to do two instructions? Some people in there, if you don't know, just want to say it, this is MIPS 32 bits, MIPS 1, it's four byte instructions. So every single four bytes can be a different instruction, so that's why you can put four bytes for your oper uh, operands to the opcode. Cool. So this is kind of, you know, kind of like annoying. You can say it takes time. You sit down, make some coffee, not get distracted by Mr. Robot or whatever you're watching. So what about making our lives easier? We want to find vulns, right? That's our jobs. It's what we want to do. We want to pop shells. We just, that's all we want to do. So I learned about something called GPL, the general public license, right? So when I was reading from it at a high level, I was like, if you license your binary and your source, everything on a GPL, you have to publish it. The source has to be out there. If it's on a GPL and you're like, no, I'm not going to give you the source, that's a violation. So what if I take, I don't know, vendor A into Google and type in source code? Cool. This is all the tarballs for that device. If you download this tarball and if you modify a little bit with the symbolic links that are inside of it because sometimes they break, you can compile your own binary for that device. It will upload and all that good stuff, which is what I did on this one. What about smart TVs? Complete source code is on there too. No need to take it apart and probe the flash chip on the SPI interface. Don't do that. Complete source code is in there. And you may find some old libraries. Maybe WebKit is old on there. I don't know. And last vendor. Again, GPL. It's vendor name. All there. Very, very straightforward and everything is documented beautifully. I love these guys. So it goes on and on, right? It goes on and on and on and you will run into two different types of like GPL codes with this type of devices. You'll have your Linux boxes and then your RTOS boxes and they're completely different and I'll talk about that a little bit more on but yeah. So I talked a little bit about software and how to get into it, how I taught myself, how to like, you know, go over the hurdles of learning assembly so I can actually read this stuff and interpret what I'm reading. What about the hardware, right? Like when I started getting into this, I exhausted the software stack completely at one point. I'm like, I'm completely stuck. I have to start opening this stuff up. So the thing is though, you have different levels of like, I don't know, you can say uh, advancedness to your lab. You can build a super dream of your lab, you know, super lab of your dreams. And you're dropping acid on chips. And you're doing all this crazy stuff. But you don't really need that. Majority of things that I do use this, maybe some of these, and that's about it. Hold on, let me go back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and maybe some of those. Yeah, cool. So what I wanted to say is that the bare bones stuff, it says $95 to $100 or whatever, but that's the biggest chunks from the multimeter and the soldering iron itself, right? If you have friends or just have them laying around, that's your biggest chunk's going to go away. The jtagulator, that's a controversial topic in my opinion because 
If you go under the JTAG enum project for the Arduino nanos, which is uh, in my bed, which I have, you can build yourself a JTAGulator basically for about five bucks. <laughs> so these things, right? Have you ever seen like an Arduino, these little five, three dollar cheapy things from eBay, right? Um, if you look at the JTAGulator source, you can see that there's a comment saying that the, the logic from it was actually pulled from the JTAG enum project for the Arduino Nano. Cool. So the same logic is in there too. What's the difference though? Like why is that so expensive and you can do this whole thing? You can't do voltage control on this. I can't say, all right, and give me 1.8 logic for your software. It's not going to work like that. It's just 3.3. So I would have to make my own like, like logic converter or like some sort of shield. So that's where the other thing comes into play. So that's where the JTAG comes more like friendly and stuff like that. But I'll talk, I'll talk about that another time or offline. And then the logic analyzer is fantastic because I've seen so many boards where I go, what the hell does this test point do? Where does it go? I can't figure it out. Hook up the logic analyzer, do a quick sample, analyze what you see, and just go forward from there. So in guessing, probing stuff with a multimeter has a very low sample rate, you're going to go crazy because I did. So finding UART. So you are in a nutshell, right? Most people in here most know you are. It's basically just think of it like Telnet or SH. You got a command line, or it's just a serial output from the device. So what about finding this kind of stuff without opening the device? What if I bought some $300 device and I go, I don't want to open it up because what if I break it? Because I will, right? So every single wireless device, at least in the states, um, it has to go through something called FCC qualifications. It has to be tested. If it's wireless, does radio has to be qualified. So you take this number called the SEC ID, you go on FCC's website, click a little button called internal photos, which is great, and you get the complete PCB front and back, up and down, left, right, Konami code. Awesome. And right there, like this is like not all the time, but this is a very good hunch. When you see a rows of pins like that, like those five pins I highlight right there, it looks like something that may be useful for development or testing. I don't know, it kind of looks like a shell interface and the one below that may be some sort of JTAG interface to test like the processor or anything that's in the JTAG chain. But that's my first suspicion. So I go, that's UART maybe, so let me go probe and test it out. Uh, and spoiler alert, it was. Cool. So that was some easy ways. But one thing I really want to stress don't make the same mistakes I did. Find your ground first. <laughs> I've had too many smoke shows or too many uh, moments when I'm just like, oh, yeah, that should be fine. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> so find your ground first. The one, the one thing that I like to do uh, is like I find common grounds. Like this is like a, a shield. There was a shielding over it. I took it off. I found it to be a common ground. But like USB casings on the outside, they're usually grounded. Just find yourself a common ground point. Uh, if you flip on the back, you'll see also casing groundings for like uh, anything, any kind of ports. Find a ground and then don't use continuity mode. I used to say that and I was dead wrong. And this is why. When you use continuity mode, you know the one where you say, all right, is A connected to B and it makes a noise, right? That's pumping voltage through it. And I hooked up my logic analyzer and this was me moving the dial so we got some noise. <coughs> And the multimeter in continuity mode pumps out 1.6 volts, con continuous. So if we have any kind of fuses that are very, very sensitive or anything else that may blow that's over 1.6, I don't really see anything that you know, says I can't handle anything over 1.6, but we just want to be careful. So instead, we use resistance mode. Resistance doesn't do voltage, it doesn't pump out 1.6 volts like we saw before. So all we need to do is to say if A connects to B, we look at resistance. If it's absolute zero, they're connected. Awesome, or have no resistance in the middle. So yes, they're connected. Great. So that's how I find ground now is by using resistance because I did I was using the wrong way and um, learned that I could blow stuff up. But you are in a nutshell, right? We got transmit to receive in a common ground. There's no clock. It's going to be like some sort of like I think it's like asynchronous or something like that where you have to like tell it. Um, so basically, think of it like a phone call. You talk to somebody and you hear it. The end. But now you have to figure out how how fast it's talking. So there's methods of finding the baud rate for these UART devices and it's annoying. I don't like brute forcing UART interfaces. Is it 9600? No. Be attached. 338400 or something like that. No. So instead we take a 20 second digital capture and if anyone's used a logic analyzer you'll know that digital captures are very, very, very tiny. If this was an analog capture it would probably be in the gigs. But this is like a 20K file, right? So this is ambiguous. So uh, 
let's just use our CSI cyber skills and we enhance this photo really well. And what I'm looking for here is something called the shortest width bit. Doesn't have to be the exact one, but I'm looking for when the falling edge and the rising edge happen again. What's the distance between that? So in this one, it's 8.8 .8 microseconds. So, okay, cool. That, you found that. What can we do with that? So if we take that 8.8 .8 and we take one second over 8.8 .8 divided by a million, whatever the uh, measurement for that is, we get 11.36.36.36.36. We're going to round it to our uh, standards, which is 11.5200. But just for fun, I'm like, you know, the logic, uh, the Soleil logic analyzer comes with a uh, different kind of analyzers that come in with it. It's called the serial one. So I said, this is the baud rate. I want you to analyze this signal and see if anything comes out. And it comes back saying, this particular segment is the word start and there's a space. Cool. So now I know the transmit pin on the device. I know the ground and I know the baud rate. The receive, don't hate me, but I brute force my way around <laughs> until something clicks. Click here, enter, enter, enter. Nope. Next one. All right. I talked about UART. So how about JTAG? So what the hell is JTAG? What is it for? I've heard JTAG. I've heard people use JTAG. Blah, blah. What can you do with it? It's literally a testing, like it's a was it like a testing suite. It's supposed to be made for quick, easy ways to diagnose hardware problems without sitting down and probing everything. So this is great, but it has a lot of functionality. So what we have here is something called a tap interface. The tap interface connects to the insides of the actual logic of the chip. <laughs> it's a little bit complex. I'm not 100% there, so I'm not going to try to BS my way around. But I do understand this, which is the state machine of JTAG. So basically, when we have lines, the lines here are going to represent our mode select TMS. And then the TCK, the clock, is going to indicate when we go from next step to next step to next step, right? So let's say that I'm at run test idle. If TMS is high and the clock happens one more time, the TMS will move over there. So now I'm at select DR scan or data register. So this is how the state machine works. And if I keep TMS high, it will go all the way up to test logic reset. And <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but based on what I've seen, there's no TD TDI needed for this, and you'll get the ID code. TDI stuff, when you start doing bypass scans and you're filling every, every register up with, I believe, ones uh, to put into a bypass state, that's a different thing. But we'll go into that later. Sorry. <laughs> so locating the flash chip. So what if you find you are, and it's password protected? And you can't brute force it because brute forcing the root password takes like three seconds for every attempt. That's slow, right? So what if you also can't download the firmware when it's not public? It's some sort of like proprietary device, right? So now this is where we start getting nitty gritty. So let's start comparing this to computers. This would be the hard drive. So we just find out what, who makes this particular chip. We use Google because, you know, I'm pretty smart like that. And then we pull up our chip. And the main things I'm looking for is basically where are the interfaces that I can talk to you, the input and output, and what commands can I send it in order to extract data? And also, how can I put it in the right protect state so I don't erase something? Kind of like a floppy disk when you have that thing, right? So the thing is, though, with this is that with chips, with these flash chips, they are like a slave. When a master chip says, I want to talk to your mind, I select you. That is it. You cannot have another probe into it and talk to your chip. It's one to one. So when you're actually um, pulling the chip off or you're actually trying to dump everything. So there's two ways, right? Some people like to be non-instructive and want to keep the chip on the board. And that's a perfectly good way of doing it. And this is how you can do it. There's a, there's a thing called like a, it's, a, it's an SOIC and then the number. Like this one's eight. There's 16. There's also like uh, breakout boards that you can buy and put the chip in here and have a huge breakout you can put into a breadboard and do whatever you want. Um, but this also this way. But the problem with this one is that you have to provide power to the chip because it's not going to turn on on like magic, right? But you may turn on other devices around it, and you may put the, the chip into a select mode. So that's not good. So what can we do without removing the chip? Find the reset pin on the on the processor, either ground it or put it high, whatever data sheet says. Then turn on the device fully. The device will not do anything at all, and you should be able to communicate with JTAG and everything else. Because if the like, there's been devices as well where you see JTAG for one second, then initialize, everything goes away. That's because the driver is doing it. So if you put into a reset state, everything should be communicate should communicate perfectly fine. So that's how you can do it without removing it. But I remove everything um, just because I like to do that. So that was um, a flash chip that's serial. I've been playing around with these things, and I'm pretty sure these things were made by the devil. These, 
These are known as NAND flash chips and they do everything in parallel. And uh, I have a dump here and I'll, I'll, it's offline, it's on, my, it's on my slides. And I'll show you the, the hardships I've been having with this. With all the blocks and organizing everything and that arrow is not pointing anything. But this is basically how I hooked it up. This is a FT2232H and there's all these white papers, there's a black hat talk on it. You can look it up, it's super, super simple. And this is how it works. You hook it up, you turn it on and then there's a tool out there called dump flash and you say give me the ID code and it gives you everything, gives you the page count and extracting this two gig thing took 12 hours, super fast. So this is the thing as well, what I was talking about bin walk earlier. This thing, the blocks are all over the place so I'm trying to figure out how the microcontroller wrote to the NAND flash so I can reorganize everything. Running bin walk against it goes that for about five minutes. LZMA, 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 yeah, no. So that's the only thing about NAND flash. With SPI flash running bin walk on it, done. It's serial. But once you have started having parallel uh, uh, flash memory it starts getting really complicated because it's not all nice and laid out. So exploitation. So all this software, hardware stuff, all right, cool, we've heard a million times. Let's actually break some stuff, right? That's what we're here for. So one thing I've noticed a lot, so a lot of red teamers will probably know this as well. Developers love to keep debug code in production stuff. Why? Yeah, there's no, there's no TV, there's no monitor hooked up, so who cares, right? So when I first found a vuln and I, you know, made the crash, this came out out of UART and it said your return address is 43, 43, 43 and your, your program counter is that too. Cool, so now I know my offsets all off the bat. So um, just to verify I did it again, so look for uh, debug code for signal catchers. It's probably in there. So you don't have to like cross compile GDB and attach and all that good stuff. So analyze the crash, so like, you know, it's the same thing over and over again, just like x86, analyze the crash, find your offsets and you put everything in place and everything will work. So analyzing function returns. This is how I taught myself all this stuff like I said before. So we have the same program, two architectures. We have x86, all this is doing is just calling stir copy, taking argument value one and destroying it into like a stack buffer of like, I don't know, it's really, really small. <laughs> and then, uh, and then it prints out some stuff and then it returns, right? But then we have leave and ret. So leave, so EBP and ESP CB switch, I believe. And then we have ret. So then we have whatever ESP is pointed to, it's going to pop those four bytes into EIP and move over plus four. Cool. So MIPS, same thing. Load word RA from some, off stack, some offset from the stack. RA is return address. In MIPS we have a dedicated register for return addresses. Load word frame pointer from this thing. Same thing, you know, it's like leave. So we have the same thing. Restore the frame pointer, restore the stack, and then jump RA or ret. So instead of having the instructions in one thing, it's just broken out. Load it and then jump. Cool. So x86 and now ARM. So ARM is a very special architecture. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. So going from MIPS to ARM is a little bit different, um, but basically the same things are going to be the same. The same thing, function return and entry and yada, yada, yada. We just uh, return everything it was when we called it, right? So the one thing also with ARM is they have different modes and some MIPS architectures also have this where you have something called a thumb mode and an ARM mode. Very, very easy nutshell. So uh, thumb mode is a 16-bit interpreter. So we have two-byte interpretations for instructions. The way that happens, you have something called, uh, I think it's jump and link exchange or branch and link exchange, sorry. And if that, the address that is going to, if the least significant bit is set, minus one, go back to that memory, yeah, minus one of that memory and then put everything into 16-bit mode. That's how it works. So if we jump into a odd memory and it's jump and exchange, 16-bit, if not, then it's uh, R mode. Cool. So like I said before, if we just analyze everything, we kind of know where everything's going into play. We can predict things now. So I know this is a little boring. I apologize, guys. So just like before, we're just crashing, analyzing, crashing. All right, now we're starting to see everything coming into play. Everything's starting to really look the same as x86, just different instructions. It's all it is. Instruction hunting in LibC, though, is a different story, especially in MIPS. x86, you guys are spoiled, spoiled with instructions. Stack buffer overflow, no NX, jump ESP, right? You know, basically. I'm not going to say that's every single situation, but basically, right? Win. Simple. No NX, that's all we care about. MIPS. Jump register stack. Nope. Move stack into T9. Maybe we can call T9. Nope. Let's go screw yourself. So this one is more complicated. We have to ROP in order to do a basic stack 
execution. We don't care about NX. We're not calling any kind of APIs to modify memory uh, uh, attributes. So this one was a little bit more interesting. So what I had to do was I had to chain gadgets together. And I completely skipped that by accident. So sorry about that. So basically what I had to do from the very beginning, I only had a limited set of registers. So all first gadget, get more registers. Then I sleep because when I was doing this at the time, I was hearing about instruction cache flushing. Not every single MIPS device has that. This is an R3000 MIPS one. It doesn't use instruction caching at all. There was no reason to go into sleep. But I did it anyways. And then from there, it's to adjust, uh, put the stack, add A18 offset into it and put into A1. Move A1 to T9, jump T9. That is how I did jump ESP on MIPS. So one thing that was a little annoying and just like we all have with X86 that we've done before, there are null bytes. So when I first came into this, it seemed like every single instruction had null bytes and I said, you know what, forget this router stuff. I'm going back to desktop space. GG. I'm done. You guys can have fun with this. But then I relaxed. I said, all right, let's actually relax. What about XOR? What if I just, I don't know, XOR this and that? Dope. So we don't have null bytes. So we can just make an XOR encoder. So in a nutshell though, the whole thing is still the same ideas and techniques that we've used with x86. It's just a different instruction set. That is it. So um, before I go into this a little bit more, the shellcode stuff that I've done before and a little bit the, uh, the I don't know, like the pre prelude or whatever to the um, shellcode, I did everything in RASM. I use uh, I use RASM2 to assemble all my up, uh, all my instructions into opcodes because I didn't feel like using an assembler and trying to get everything working correctly. No, screw it. I just want these instructions, and I'm just going to copy these opcodes into my payload, and that's going to be done with it. So this one, all I did there was I XORed S0 with S0 stored in S0. Why? In MIPS, four nulls is no op. And when I was jumping back to the stack, I had an address that was not resolving to an actual instruction, so I just overwrote it with nulls. It's a knob slide. I know it's dirty, but it worked. So in a nutshell, grab your libc address, find your extraction offsets, craft your shell code, test your exploit in QEMU or Q, whatever you want to call it. I'm really bad with butchering these names. I test everything in emulation first. And then from there, all I had to do was replace the libc base address. Because a lot of these devices don't use ASLR, even though uh, randomized VA space is set to two. Doesn't work. Crash the device, restart it many, many times. LibC and everything else, all the other libraries that it loads are going to be in the same place every time. So, this example is from something I've made. It's called the DVRF project or Dan Vulnerable Router. Yeah, it's kind of funny, but. Um, so, this one, the, it's a, the very first level, it's just a stack buff overflow. And I wanted to show that this is in Quimu. And I took the same exact payload, the pattern is different, but still the same payload, copied it to my device, and it works beautifully. Great. So going forward though, I'm talking about all this exploitation stuff and I was guilty of doing this. I was super guilty of doing this. I would find a vuln. I would say, yes, PC is 41, 41, 41. I am done. Drop mic. But that doesn't do anything. I was limiting myself and I was limiting my growth. So we need to get away from this. We need no more DOS pops. And I vote that we, we make pox great again. But don't worry, I'm not going to build a Faraday wall around these devices and made the vendors pay for it. <laughs> I guarantee you that. So this is my demo now. So um, yeah, so let's get started. Uh, but before I do this, I like to get, kind of like get into character, kind of have fun with this. You know, we're, we stay here all day, we see talks, we need to have some fun, right? So have you, have you guys ever seen stock photos of hackers? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, uh, so before we get started, I'm going to set up the environment first. So the application I'll be exploiting in this demo is called Socket BOF. Um, the application, all it does, it's listening on a socket, and whatever data it gets, it just start copies it. <laughs> these uh, these levels and stuff I'll talk about towards the end are supposed to be educational levels to help you learn about this kind of stuff. But let's get, let's just set this up. What? 
<laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Huh. Yeah, hold on. There we go. Yep. All right. Sorry about that. All right. Um, before we get started, can we kill the lights? <laughs> All right, awesome. So what I'm going to do here, um, I forgot my own arguments for my own script, so that's why I had to print out the help. So we're going to set this whole thing up. And I'm going to get my microphone because my computer's going to do the rest of the talking. Sorry, I'm a little slow. <laughs> huh? Thank you. Uh, let me make sure that it's actually. <laughs> So I want to make sure, you know, I don't want the demo gods to get mad at me. So we did this on 8080, right? So now, so over here, uh, let's make a new tab, nc-l-v-p. So now we have a netcat listener waiting. And I'm now going to make sure that's right, 8080. All right, cool. So uh, without further ado, let's get this going. Oh no, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> the sound's not working. No, I don't. Oh man. No. Oh, it works. Front, left. All right, cool. Hello, IoT Village. Before we begin, I want to say that this will be my last performance of this demo. With that out of the way, let's corrupt this application stack. But first, we need some sick hacking music. That's better. Now we need to cover our tracks for that offset. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> so we can also verify, so this application is still in this stuck state. So if I go back to Netcat and just kill it to just verify, then it's, you know, it returns. So that was an actual exploit. So thank you for bearing with that. Like I said, I just want to have fun. You can bring back the lights. So like I said, I just want to have fun with that. But like I said, I went from not knowing MIPS exploitation, MIPS assembly to doing that. So it just takes some time. You guys can do it too. It's pretty straightforward. The difference is that I learned. X86 base tech buffer flow is pretty simple, straightforward, like I said, a thousand times. Ropping, just know where your ESP is and where the ret's going to happen and everything just falls into place. MIPS base tech buffer overflow is a little bit less straightforward because of the less instructions that you have than X86. But um, it's a little bit more fun, but it does require ROPing. So if you've never ROPed before in x86, you should probably do that first before coming over here. And then ROPing in MIPS, same thing. Just, you're just calling different APIs and feeding it different arguments. Same thing as, as x86. RMV5, um, I haven't finished this one yet because I'm still learning the many, 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 many different instructions that ARM provides. So this one, so far I've seen is that the gadgets can be found in different modes. The same function can represent two different types of instruction sets all in once. You can analyze a function in R mode and have different instructions that we have in thumb mode, right? Kind of as uh, expected versus 32 versus 16-bit instruction sets. So, and then at the very end, you also have something called pop PC, which can be used for your ROP. So you just pop PC, pop PC, pop PC, or RET, right? 
So interfacing with JTAG or interacting with JTAG. So this is an Arduino Zero that I bought. Um, I used it more because I had a Cortex processor and I wanted to play more with real, more real time devices. So this is the JTAG layer like I said in the beginning where you know you can use the you know, Arduino blah blah blah. But I just wanted to learn actually like how does this work? So on this device JTAG is listed out. But I was like let's brute force this and see what happens. So that's what this is JTAG layer. You just hook up as many pins as you want. Before I even do that, who here has heard of JTAGulator? I am not going further with what I was going to say about JTAGulator. <laughs> very, very straightforward, right? So, next step though. All right, so I find TDI, I find, you know, I find data in, find data out, I find mode select, I find everything I need, I find the clock. Now what? Now you have to actually interact with that interface, right? You have to actually talk to it. Um, the state machine will still be the same, but the instruction registers and the data registers, think of it as operand and opcode. Same thing, right? You have an opcode and then operand to go with it. Same thing, but it's in JTAG and they're very small registers. So there's an open source project that I use called OpenOCD. And in this one, um, it's funny because one of the devices that's in the other room, um, I actually used OpenOCD to talk to JTAG, so it's actually pretty cool to see that in here. But once you have JTAG open and it actually can talk to it, you can't just say open OCD my FTDI chip that's connected to JTAG. No, it has to actually know the profile. So if you go online, these things have many, many, many profiles already for a lot of chips. And different manufacturers, you know, like ARM, right? ARM is not a chip maker, right? It's just, it just does its uh, instruction sets and all that shit. So, but different manufacturers will implement the same JTAG state machine and all the instructions and everything else the same. So different type of manufacturers will use the same open OCD configuration. Also newer versions of the chip may also work on older versions for that JTAG as well and vice versa. So don't get stuck when you can't find the configuration file for your exact processor. Find something around it or with the same architecture and it may be the same. So when you open it up though, just, this is just for people who have never used it before, you have GDB server that opens up locally and you can start dumping memory, you can do whatever you want. It's GDB, right? So what's great about this, this was on a Cortex processor and Cortex has a very specific memory layout. And with this one, there's a specific memory address. If you look at the data sheet, you could dump AES keys and all that good stuff. So this is very powerful when we want to kind of extract information from it that we can't get to it normally. Like maybe SPI, the flash chip is encrypted or all this other crap. So this is our last resort. I always like to say that start with the software stack first, exhaust all your resources, then go to hardware and start from easy to, you know, easy to hard. It's the same thing that we always do in our everyday lives. So once we have the JTAG uh, connected and it's connected to it, we can say how fast is the clock going, I want to measure this, I want to reset the entire processor and then halt, I want to set a break point when uh, like you know say at this memory, not memory address, when, uh, when memory address is being written to here or like when the kernel is being loaded, we can do whatever we want. So like for example, if there's UART password, you can use this at a watch point when the kernel uh, arguments are being loaded, set it to single user mode, let it load, done. So wrapping up, so I, I want to say thank you guys a lot for sitting through this. I know I've been a little repetitive or a little fast, but thank you guys. This is wrapping up now. So this is my project. This is the uh, demo that I gave you guys. Uh, this is called my damn vulnerable router firmware. Where did this come from? This is the literal story. I was in my shower thinking about damn vulnerable web app, damn vulnerable Linux. I was like that's so silly. You have so many of those. There's not one for routers. So I'm going to make one. <laughs> so that's what happened. But how did I do this? Remember that tarball thing I told you from a while ago? This device was sitting in my closet not doing anything. It's a $10 device now. It's an AO211N. And I just picked up my thing. I was like, oh, let's start writing firmware for this. Let's actually do it. So that's what I did. I downloaded tarball and just started ripping everything out. I started learning how they did everything and just made my own custom uh, tarball for it. And that's on GitHub. You can download it. You can fork it. You can do whatever the hell you want with it. But this is how this works. So I'm working on another device. The device is actually, actually, they actually have it in there as well. It's a trendnet. It's an ARM uh, device as well. I'm just having issues compiling the kernel. Um, it keeps bombing out for some reason saying that uh, processor H is not found. So uh, once I figure that out and kind of fix that, then I'll have another DVRF build for ARM. And what's good about this is that there's two ways to do this. You can put the firmware on your device. You can always revert back to. There's not a one-way street. And when you do that, the device, the, the ponables that I have on there are only accessible through UART. You have to start them through UART. So this forces you to open up the device, plug through UART, find the directory, find the executable, run it, right? Or you can emulate it. I prefer both ways. Just do everything that you can. As long as you get the point B, who cares, right? But this, this idea was to learn, to help people dig into this, get the hands-on experience with exploiting stuff outside the x86 space, and also help 
IoT developers, I say IoT like this, just it's a keyword that's very stuck in my brain. <laughs> so help people learn this stuff as well because I've seen 90s programming code in today's architecture. When I was doing example codes of start copy and just you know funny stuff, that's actually happening today. I will be demoing an exploit tomorrow that's an actual one that I found that does this kind of stuff and I'll be chaining four vaults together in order to get complete compromise. But that'll be for tomorrow, it's in the IoT village, same with plug. So this is where you can download the dam damn vulnerable router firmware stuff on GitHub. That's the, the link, it's on Praetorian's GitHub. I am updating it. I, you know, if, it, if you want to update it as well, more people, the better. Uh, this is for the community. I just wanted to see if I can teach what I've learned. That's all I want to do with all this stuff. If I can learn it, you can learn it as well. I'm not some amazing guy. I'm just some little kid from Texas. My future plans is to keep working on this stuff, do the arm one, get that finished. I have a blog post that I've done on introductory to uh, hardware exploit well, software exploitation and then getting started with this project as well. And that code for this exploit that I demoed is on the blog as well, fully documented as well. You can copy and paste it and do whatever the hell you want. The shell code is in there as well from Bowcaster. And yeah, take a look at it, do whatever you want. I'm also available on Twitter and I'm always available to help you guys out. There's no such thing as a dumb answer or dumb question. There may be a dumb answer from me. No such thing as a dumb question. If you are confused, lost, need some help, or going, hey man, I've been probing this thing for hours, can, can't find anything, can you help me out, I'm always here to help you guys. That's what I want to do is teach and help people grow. That's what we're all doing here is to grow, right? That's why we go to conferences. So uh, before we wrap up, I'll be holding a workshop tomorrow at the IoT Village at 10 a.m. Uh, basically it's a bring, bring your own device type thing or maybe sh take one or borrow one from IoT Village or just share one from a researcher. We're doing a zero day hunting workshop. But we're not just finding volumes, we're going to take it all the way to code exec too. So attendees will be uh, encouraged to craft exploits for the volumes that they find. All the volumes that are found just because of you know disclosure policies and stuff like that will be safely disclosed over PGP or whatever uh, communication the vendor prefers. Uh, to the vendor first and then we'll do the exploitation and get that underway and then you can go, you know, claim your prizes or whatever. But I just want to help people actually find this stuff and get the hands-on experience. We sit here and watch and watch and watch and watch. Let's actually do stuff and actually commit it, right? So that's tomorrow, 10 a.m., IoT Village. Um, I can put this out online if anyone wants it. You guys take pictures too. The multimeter that I use and the USB microscope, literally Amazon came in, tried it out, worked great. Nothing more crazier than that. But the one thing I use a lot is the FT232, which by Adafruit, it's $15. Um, the equivalent is the Shikra, which is $50, has a little bit more to it, but it's the same chip. Um, so depending on your budget, you may want to go through that route. But that's the end of my talk. I appreciate you guys sitting through this. Are there any questions before we say, get out? <laughs> yes? So the question was um, around uh, what was it the manipulation of uh, chips if like JTAG is disabled and stuff like that. So there's there's one question around that too. How is JTAG disabled? Is it software disable or is it a fuse? If it's a hardware disable, you're kind of screwed unless you can you know decap it and like fuse that fuse back together to bridge it. If it's software, find the reset pin, ground it or you know do what the data sheet says, but it's usually ground it, power it on, everything will turn on and no software will be loaded and the JTAG state machine will be accessible. So, but if it's the latter, you're kind of screwed. So that's the only downfall, right? Yes? What if uh, GDB is not enabled on their device? If GDB what? It's not enabled. So I have cross-compiled GDB and I can teach you guys how to do this well. So on my device as well, I had, uh, there's no GDB on it and I had to craft my exploit. So that's why I was doing the emulation route. But I did cross-compile GDB for uh, MIPS and I believe it was like MIPS Big Indian and Little Indian for, uh, for generic instruction of MIPS 1. So that's on there. You can compile it yourself. It's a little bit pain in the ass, but it's doable. Um, so you would have to cross compile it yourself, put it on the device, or if the device doesn't have enough space on it, you're going to have to go through the emulation route. So that's the only two ways. Cross compile it yourself, put it onto the device, because most devices usually have wget. Um, they usually have wget, or you can just echo it through the serial interface and just put it into a file, right? So. Uh, put GDB on it, run it, or just emulate yourself through Q QE mode or whatever you want to use. So that's if you put a GDB on it, do you have the access? If what? Do you have access to it? If you have access to GDB? If you don't have access to the device, how can you put a GDB 
Oh, you can put GDB server on it. GDB server, and then just attach it to the process, have it listening on the socket, connect over its socket over the network, and that's it. That's that's the way I've done it. Like <laughs> I've always either GDB and then I put GDB and I use it over a serial interface, or GDB server connect over a socket and just do everything like that, or just emulate it. That's pretty much it. Nothing too crazy there. Are there any more questions? Yes. Uh, what hardware did you use to talk to the flash chips? Yes. So the question was, what is the hardware that I use to talk to the flash chips and stuff? That is the Adafruit uh, FT232H breakout board. Um, it is a FTDI chip and it supports JTAG, SPI, I squared C, UART, um, and I believe that's about it, but it, there may be more, but that's what I used. And um, in the open OCD, you just tell it the driver to use is FTDI and it will automatically attach to it. So, uh, yeah, that's $15, man. So that's, that's the one I use. Um, any more questions? Yes. So this one is kind of a a heavy question. So uh, he was talking about the Cortex M3, M4s, you know, the the real time devices and the trusted trusted model uh, trusted models, right? Trusted yes, trusted platform. I haven't looked into that, so I don't know at this time. Um, so I would have to follow up later. So right now, I just don't know. I don't want to give you a bad answer. Um, so yeah, let's sync up afterwards because I want to find you that answer because I'm curious now as well. Um, any more questions? Nope. Yeah, sure. Um, so if you guys want to, you know, see what's going on in my not so interesting life, um, hold on one second. Uh, yeah, so my Twitter is, it's Black Owl, but someone already had that name. So I said no. So I replaced the L with a 1 and the O with a 0. <laughs> That's about it. Nothing too crazy. Uh, the image is I was fuzzing libpng with an owl image and it looks pretty cool so I took a screenshot. <laughs> So uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, any more questions before I just wrap up? No? Great. Again, thank you guys. Let's have a great conference.